At the heart of a successful value investment philosophy lies the ability to go against the crowd and even one's own natural inc inclinations. But being able to enjoy unpopular and unfashionable positions often results in outstanding investment results. We talked to ReCM founder Pete Filiun and newly appointed CEO Jan van Niekek on the firm's approach and how it is, shaking it is taking place in uh, today's investment cli climate. Let me begin with you, uh, Pete. Now, is it just as simple as going against what the crowd is saying? Or is there more that informs that contrarian view? Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, the words going against the crowd sort of describes the situation you find yourself in once you've made your value investment. Right. Uh, so, so let's just go back to first principles. Value investing means you're buying assets which are priced cheaply. The price is below the intrinsic value. Price, assets only get priced cheaply when there is bad news. Right. When the crowd is running the other way. That's when assets get priced cheaply. Assets don't get priced cheaply when there's good news around and everybody's happy and there's a big party on the go. Assets are generally not priced cheaply under those conditions. So, so, so what we do as a value investor is buying cheap assets. We're buying assets where bad things have happened, where right. nobody wants to be because there might be some strikes on the mines or there might be this or that happening. But the intrinsic value is still there, it's still intact. Right. So it is intrinsic value for you yes. that is the major attraction and that's what yeah. you focus on. So what we spend our time on all day long is trying to understand the economics of a business, how, uh, how and how much cash flows it generates over time and what it, that is worth to us. That, that's what we spend our time on. And after we've done that, then we might look at the share price on the stock market to see you know, whether it's a good investment or not. None of our analysts, including myself, have share prices on their screens. We don't know what's going on in the market on a day-to-day -day basis. Sounds like Warren Buffett. It's just well, <laughs> you know, not a bad example to follow. I wish we could do it 100%, but we just aspire to that sort of. I think sort. Warren Buffett doesn't uh, doesn't have a computer in his office no. and he doesn't have a calculator. We, we, we unfortunately do have computers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you also ride the bicycle around Omaha. <laughs> Pete, just to come back to that, we've obviously got a, quite an interesting market at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, and one, I looked at the, the chart for the All Share Index uh, the other day, and from sort of July last year, it's just gone yes. vertical. So yeah. when we talk about these, the unfashionable and the unloved, <coughs> I have a pretty good sense of where, where yep. you're going to start, but take us through wh what you've been finding value in at the moment. So, so there's basically uh, two areas in the market, and the, and, the, and the big one is in the commodity producers, the cyclicals where you know we've all seen the news of the past year there have been wildcat strikes there have been uh, cost pressures there have been all sorts of bad news hitting these companies um, but if one looks at those companies one will understand what you're actually buying is lots and lots of future production the for platinum companies for instance there's lots of platinum in the ground that they own mm. that they're going to take out next year and the year after and five years and ten years and twenty years down the line now, who knows what the economic conditions are going to be like in five or ten years' time. There might be a boom, there might not be a boom. But, you know, it's not going to be the same as it is today. So what the market is doing is extrapolating today's conditions over the life of those reserves. And we just take an average view, say some years are going to be good, some years are going to be bad. It's not going to be all bad. And taking that view, we come out with a value for these companies, which is well above current market prices, which is why, in our terms, they make up good investments. Now, Bearing in mind, these are the same companies that five years ago, in 2007, investors could not get enough of. Today, they don't want anything to do with them. 2007, we were not invested in these companies. We invested in boring, blue-chip, dividend-paying companies like Esso Breweries and Tiger Brands and those sort of companies in 2007. Not the popular ones because they weren't part of the commodity super cycle, because that was a the story then. Mm -hmm. Again, we went against the crowd in 2007 that worked out very well. Today we find ourselves in a similar situation, not because we like going against the crowd, it's not fun, it's just that the crowd runs away and leaves behind cheaply priced merchandise. And that's the sort of stuff that we like, what, like to buy. Yeah, and you, you've kind of, you've studied these, these fund managers uh, over the course of your career with Citadel prior to joining ReCM, and, and obviously you, you mentioned off air that you have uh, you, s you really buy into the value approach. In fact, it's, it's, only, it's only real game in town for you. Is, is this kind of hard to do? I mean, when you see these guys going really against the grain, you watch the Pete's of the world uh, and some of the other value managers, is it, you know, this counterintuitiveness, is it easy to digest when you're the custodian of other people's money like you were with Citadel? Look, when, <coughs> when you're involved in look, looking after other people's money, there's a chain of trust between the ultimate you know, investment decision maker and the person whose money it is. 
Um, and the further away you are from the person making the investment decision, it's more difficult to stay the course. So therefore it is important you know, for those people that do invest with value managers to be as close as possible to the investment decision makers because you can have a, a constant confirmation and a conversation to find out why they do what they do. Um, as in, you know, a custodian of someone else's assets allocating money, um, you know, it is as difficult. Remember, as Pete point out, you know, the current news flow on the day, which, which most people see, tend to be negative around many of the, the investments that a value investor make. Um, and it is important to be able to communicate to your clients why it is that you are sticking to your discipline and why you do what you do. So you've almost got to, you've almost got to convert them to the value uh, approach to investing, even if they're not obviously financial people by training or professional or anything like that. They've got to be able to understand this process because ultimately if they panic and they, st they are uncomfortable with the positions the investment manager is taking, they can ultimately withdraw their funds and then it's, you know, it's a self-fulfilling circle. Look, unfortunately, that's the pattern in history that you see. The last time the value cycle, so to speak, was at its worst was in 2001 at the end of the, the dot-com bubble. If you looked around the world then, you couldn't find many value investors you know, globally nor in South Africa at the time. Um, you know, for fast forward six or seven years after the value style of investing is done well, and then all of a sudden there were many value investors by name again. But that's where it's important to have to be able to have a conversation and look at the portfolios and see which guys really are value investors, you know, and which only claim to be value investors because it's working at the moment. Yeah, let's bring the conversation to the real world. I mean, we talk about South African mining and the spaces it is in now. Uh, I think we all know the factors, the costs, the strikes, the tense relations, and mm -hmm. some people's predictions that we are likely to see more labor unrest. Where do you guys stand? What's your house view on uh, uh, the South African mining sector? Uh, the house view is that the stocks, the, company, the companies are priced way below the intrinsic value. Uh, we have no house view on the future. Uh, we don't know what the future holds. Sure. Uh, and we don't spend any time at all trying to forecast what's going to happen in the future because we're probably going to end up being completely wrong. Sure. So all we say is, this is the set of assets that these companies own. Over time, that set of assets should produce returns that look like this. Some years are going to be worse and other years are going to be better. Right. But over time, it should average out to some sort of number. And it's, we, tend, we try and focus on what is that number. Obviously, that, it's not one number. Yeah. It's sort of a broad range, roughly. It's a, gr it's a gray area. But as long as if the price is well below that gray area, then you've got a margin of safety. Because that is one of the principles we use is a margin of safety. Yeah. So if you're wrong, you still don't lose money. And right. that's what the margin of safety is all about. And within the sector, are there some that are looking better than others? And really, I want to throw the question to both of you. So, so, so some of them are better quality than others because yeah. of the access to low-cost, long-life reserves. Some platinum companies have better access to low-cost, long-life reserves. Other yeah. platinum companies have shorter term, you know, the reserves might run out in a couple of years, so they are lower quality. We tend to focus on the higher quality end of that spectrum. Yanni, you got any views on, so on that in particular? The only point to make is, I think Pete touched on it, is that there's no view on the sector. We look at yeah. specific businesses. Right. And it happened to be that, you know, the way the market price at the moment is that you find quite a few businesses in the mining producing sector where the prices are, you know, way cheaper than the intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Pete, this is quite an important point because obviously you could say pretty much indiscriminately that resource ca companies are very cheap at the moment in South Africa, perhaps mm -hmm. even globally. Yes. But how do you manage that from a portfolio perspective? Because otherwise you'd end up with 60% of your portfolio in, in resource counters. How do you sort of counter away that and, and blend your portfolio to prevent a bias in any one direction? Well, when resource co companies were very expensive in 2007, they made up 60% of the market and people weren't scared to be overweight at that point in time. So <laughs> today they're down to 30% of the market. And uh, you know we, we're running at an overweight situation, not that we really look at the market, uh, but we're running with a significant exposure to these companies. We think if th something is cheap, we should have access to that. We should have exposure to that. Um, so obviously you're not gonna put all your money in there. Fortunately there is, and that's, uh, that's one area I, I didn't mention earlier on, there's another pool of companies which are fairly cheap, and that's the hotel and gaming sector. Uh, the Sun International the Tsochos of the world, they're also quite cheap. So we, we, you know, we have exposure in that area as well. Just to, so I kind of understand your, the, the inefficiency taking place on one side of the market. Yeah. On the other hand, we've got some very overvalued counters. Yeah. And I wanted to just get your opinion on, on retailers in particular. Um, do you think the, 
the relative, uh, exp the, expensive, uh, the expensiveness of, of retailers at this point is a function of the different views that local and foreign investors have on these companies? I think it's, it's, there, there's a couple of strands to, to that story. And the one strand is yes, uh, the foreign investors have this invest in Africa thing going on. And what's the best way to access that? Well, it's via South African retailers which are expanding into Africa. So it's a theme, it's a story. And we're always very careful of stories and themes. I think you get really hurt by investing in themes because the market is smart. The market prices in the upside very, very quickly. I mean, the previous big theme was the commodity super cycle. That was the previous. Now it's Africa. Now we're not Africa, Africa pessimists or optimists. We invest people's money. And we need to do a good job with that. At the moment, African assets to us seem very expensive. It's a limited pool of assets being chased by a whole bunch of investors. So lots of demand, not that much supply. I think you know, that might turn out badly for investors. The African continent itself will grow. There will be growth. Yeah. There will be money made by businesses. I don't think outside passive minority investors are going to come out well out of this. So where is value, Jan? Where are you guys seeing value? Well, I think as Pete said, we, you know, in the resources sector and also in the hotel and gaming sector. Globally as well? Um, globally, you know, again, you know, we, we find big lo or large international banks to be cheap because, you know, y if you follow the news flow, you can see there's lots of bad news around those, you know, these guys so-called created the financial, uh, the bubble, uh, created the financial crisis that came out of 2008. Yeah. So, and there's still a lot of distrust around that. And that means that, you know, very few people are looking there and there are, you know, opportunities to be had. Yeah, but you're saying you're finding value in banks, but we, we also know that the banks, of course, are sitting with a lot of the debt. That's uh, part of the reason why the world is in trouble at the moment. So what are you seeing beyond uh, these potentially bad loans, including sovereigns, that these banks may be sitting with? I think the point is that we don't know anything about the specific detail of the asset that these banks hold better than any other, other analyst, and we don't claim to know that. Sure. What we can judge is that the market's assessment is exactly that there's so much bad news still to come that it's unlikely that all of the news that's going to come out will be that bad. And I think that's the only thing we need to know, is that it is unlikely to turn out as bad as the market is pricing at the moment.